Yeah, right. Well, you, you know, and, and I hope I, I hope Greg's doing well. Um, oh, yeah. I, I hope so, read, too. I, re, I read his post, and, um, you know, good thing that they caught that cancer early. I hope yeah. That, uh, you know, I hope that, that he beats it. So sounds like he's doing pretty pretty well. Yeah. Do you ever, do you ever talk to him? Choice. Pardon me? Do you ever talk to him? Um, occasionally, not very often, but occasionally. Okay. I'm, I'm a lot less active in the, in the profession these days, so I don't go to, I'm, I'm boycotting AMS meetings, for example. <laughs> so I don't see very many people anymore. <laughs> you, uh... So, well, Damon, are we are we live? Are on the we website? starting? We go ahead and uh, introduce yeah. Chuck. I know a lot of people know him, but there are probably some people, believe it or not, don't know who who we're talking to here. Okay, we good to go. Uh, hey, Danielle, they done? Yeah, they're done. I wasn't sure what was going on. I saw live okay. up in the corner, so I apologize cool. in advance if I've been looking or sounding ridiculous over here. <laughs> All right. Well, here we are now, episode number thirty of the Oklahoma Weather Show. Today is August sixth, twenty fourteen. We have. A very popular man in the weather community, Chuck Doswell, joining us on the show today. Chuck, I know you're a very busy man, so we are thankful that you're able to sit down with us for a couple minutes to talk about some weather. I know uh, certainly you're you're always being asked to do events. You have your your show, High Instability, and then uh, you know, of course, we're we're thankful that you're you're joining us here. Danielle was actually able to get a hold of you and bring you on the show today. So, Danielle, take it away. First off, Dr. Doswell, so excited that you're joining. The Oklahoma Weather Show, and you know, as Damon said, and for anyone out there who perhaps doesn't know, that's listening nationwide, who Dr. Doswell is, he's been studying weather for decades. I mean, I've read publications from you from the 1970s. Yes, I'm calling out your age a little bit here, <laughs> but um, you know, we're going to talk about a lot of different subjects. Um, regarding severe weather, obviously Oklahoma weather, since you live here and you study, study that as well. So the first topic, obviously, storm chasing. That seems to be a big issue or controversial subject, I guess, nowadays. And so we just want to hear your thoughts. And, and we know you're not afraid to tell people what you think. So what's going on with this whole Amateur storm chasing, and um, you know, we'll get into that. Just tell us your thoughts. Well, from my perspective, chasing has changed tremendously over the years for a number of reasons. Technologically, it's a lot easier to chase than it used to be. When I started, we had to make our own forecast, and we didn't have live internet in the field or anything like that, so it was much more difficult, and there were uh, a lot fewer of us. Twister made a huge difference in the number of chasers out there and like any group when you uh, get a larger group of people you have uh, an increase in the number of people out on what I would call the wings of the distribution people who are perhaps not quite as responsible as they should be and we've seen a tremendous growth in the number of people behaving in ways that I consider to be irresponsible. Uh, but I don't control the highways and nobody has to listen to me, so there doesn't appear to be much I can do about it. Uh, I, I don't want to let those people destroy chasing for me, but uh, I have to admit uh, the size of the crowds has kind of gotten under my skin a bit. I really don't enjoy central Oklahoma chasing at all for that reason. Right, and you, you mentioned you were chasing a long time ago where technology hadn't really caught up to, to the whole aspect of storm chasing yet. Um, I would imagine nowadays, especially with all of the chasers that are out there, that cell phone coverage and being able to get data on your phone and, and Google Maps and things like that is probably a lot more uh, difficult. Well, I would say that uh, uh, the difference is, is phenomenal, and I don't mind having access to all that data when I'm chasing. It certainly increases the uh, likelihood I'm going to be in the right place at the right time. But unfortunately, that also means that a lot of people are out there who aren't even meteorologists. You had to be a meteorologist in order to make your own forecast back then and you had to be a meteorologist to know something about storms to be in the right place at the right time. 
nowadays with all of that data available to you on your on your smartphone you don't have to know diddly squat in order to be a successful storm chaser so you there know, are a lot of people out there who don't know diddly squat you know chuck you make you make a very interesting point here because i remember you know back in the in the 80s and 90s if you went storm chasing then you had this big suv and you had three laptops and you had all these you know, radar screens and you had flashing lights and all that stuff and now people go out storm chasing and this is all they need. All That's they need right. is, is is their smartphone and as you mentioned, you know, now basically, you know, anyone's out there chasing. Um, what have you noticed, uh, you know, since, since your early chasing days, how much has the traffic increased, would you say? Phenomenally. Exponentially. Uh, in many cases it gets out of hand where you have these long caravans if you have a single isolated storm and there's limited roads essentially all the chasers are funneled onto the same road and you end up with lines of a hundred two hundred three hundred vehicles all dashing about sort of aimlessly uh, that's just not something I want to be part of anymore uh, when I see that I bail out and go somewhere where there aren't so many vehicles. Even if it means I miss everything. <laughs> I would rather do that than try to deal with all that nonsense. Yeah. And it seems like, as you said, a, a lot of people are going out and trying to chase that have really no background in meteorology whatsoever. Maybe they're just a photographer that loves taking images of pictures. And, and, so, and then you have the people that perhaps do have a background in weather or the meteorologist and they've never actually storm chased before. So, I mean, what do you what do you say to those people that, you know, do have a background in weather that perhaps want to storm chase but don't necessarily know the ropes yet? I mean, obviously you would want to go with somebody that's experienced, that's done it before. But what's on that? Yeah, I think that's good advice. If you're going to, I have no problem with people being interested in the weather, and and I think storm chasing and the availability of storm chasing has brought a lot of closet weather geeks out, and and I've got no problem with that. Uh, but there are two things that I would admonish them to think about. One is what you mentioned: go out and chase with somebody experienced for a while. And, and try to see what they're doing and how they're doing it. And, and uh, secondly, and this is a fairly important one, I think a responsible chaser feels an obligation to give something back to society and the community for the pleasure of having to go out and watch, uh, having the opportunity to go out and watch uh, nature's uh, spectacle. It just uh, it seems obvious to me that we owe a debt to the rest of society that we should find a way to bring something back. That's great advice. As a matter of fact, I'm just tweeting that out right now. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I think that one problem that we've that we discover, especially nowadays, is that you know you the the it's easier to chase. You know, I mean. I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, having a vehicle in college was was not something that was just going to be given to me. I mean, I had to work hard to have a car in college, and now you know I, I see a lot more kids, especially these days, going to college, especially OU. They have cars, they have means of transportation, and I can't tell you how many times you know I've had a couple of interns say, "Oh, we're going to go out chasing today," and I can't come in. And uh, you know, it, it, it seems that. Nowadays, people just go out for chasing, and they want to see something bad happen. It's sad, but they want to see something bad happen. You know, you always, I always say, choose life over yeah. wishing on a tornado. Um, yeah. But it happens. I was actually, I was up at the University of Ohio a couple, um, a couple months ago, and here you have they were, they just so happened to have a chase tour down here, and they were chasing on May 20th, and there's this this big EF5 tornado in their background, and they're doing the big Ohio O and the U and all that, you know. And, and it's like, guys, no, this is choose life. Uh, and and, and well, it actually kind of got under my skin a little bit. I can understand why people would be excited about seeing something that's relatively, relatively difficult to see. You have to work hard to get there. And so I, I understand their excitement. 
But my problem is if, if you're that excited about a tornado, you can't restrain yourself from jumping up and down and, and cheering and so on. At the very least, don't show that on your damn video. Mm -hmm. Be sensitive to the fact that tornadoes are ugly, nasty, vicious processes in the atmosphere that don't care about humans or anything about uh, their victims. And they do tremendous damage, and they destroy lives. They destroy not just not just the fatalities, but the terrible injuries and the loss of, of homes. There are devastating consequences to these things. Does it make sense to advertise that you're excited about them? And not to me. Be sensitive to the people viewing. And by the way, I would say that you guys in the media need to say, no, we're not going to show that video. No, we choose not to, even though it's newsworthy. I think you have some responsibility to say, we're not going to share that, because it's insensitive to our viewers. And we've definitely done that, Chuck. I know there's a lot of pressure to show it live, because we feel like, of course, when people see, looking at radar imagery so many times is just a bucket of spilled paint as we often hear but when people physically see oh my goodness that hook echo is doing that and it's coming to my community they're gonna more than just get out on their front porch with their camera and look to the sky many of the women will take shelter and drag the men in with them so a lot of times we, we definitely feel we're obligated to show the tornado as far as continuing to rehash well oh, this tornado was really bad we'll remind you of how bad it was we don't necessarily do that at our station, not to speak for every station, but at our station. Well, there's um, a reason I'm doing this for your station. <laughs> well, we appreciate, we appreciate that. that. We appreciate that. We like that. you, Chuck. <laughs> we like you, Chuck. <laughs> Chuck, I'd like to ask you, um, you've seen more tornadoes than, than most of us have ever even heard about, um, and it seems to me that we have violent tornadoes uh, occur often. And when they get into a metro area, they, these violent tornadoes seem to be more violent. Um, are we seeing more violent tornadoes over open areas that don't necessarily hit a city or a town? That if this EF3 were to make it into a populated area, that it may be a higher rating? Because I know you were telling me, or I was listening to you talk about the El Reno tornado. And you said this wasn't any uh, rarity, nothing that was that unusual. Um, what happened was unusual with, with, with the fatalities. Um, but as far as just a, a destructive storm as this, it's not unusual that we see this violent of a tornado um, because it's not in a metro area. Sp speak to that. Well, first of all, I agree completely that if a tornado stays out in open country, it often gets a lower rating than if it goes into a metro area. There's no question of that. Uh, all you have to do is look at the historical record, and central Oklahoma is the absolute peak of violent tornado activity in the whole world. And, of course, when you have a metro area like Oklahoma City that sprawls over a huge area, if you have a tornado in central Oklahoma, there's a fairly good chance it's going to hit somebody and hit them hard. Uh, it's much more difficult uh, for a major long track tornado to go through central Oklahoma and not hit something than it used to be. Of course, the growth of and sprawl of, of population has contributed to that. Uh, I'm not sure there's been any kind of particular trend in that frequency. Uh, I think the jury is still out about whether or not uh, the, the tendency for bad, violent tornadoes is increasing or not. But uh, even if you just look at history around here, you realize it's not unusual in central Oklahoma. That's part of the, of, of the uh, reason I'm here. There's, I wouldn't be here uh, originally if it weren't for that. So, And I'm still here, so I, I, I like it, but... I understand how people can find that disconcerting and I understand better now than I ever did how devastating these really can be so you know I think it's 
we have a responsibility to try to help people understand that, understand the risks, and having live video on the air of a tornado is a really effective way of confirming to people that yes, this tornado warning is is actually uh, something I need to be worried about, and it may actually strike me, so I need to be concerned. There's nothing wrong with that. What I object to is people jumping up and down for joy uh, when a tornado touches down. I just find that nauseating. Dr. Doswell, you made some good points, and speaking of the May 31st, 2013 tornado, for people listening that hit El Reno, um, what do you, you know, there was a whole lot of controversy at the time about the rating, right? So it was rated an EF5, and then it was re-rated, I guess you could say, to an EF3, because obviously they didn't find damage that correlated to that. You know, you talk about the EF scale and, and such. What are your thoughts on incorporating mobile radar in future rings of tornadoes? I mean, I know Oklahoma has a, the availability of all of these mobile radars, whereas there might not be other states that have that accessibility. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, I guess I'm a little frustrated with how much people seem to care about a single number we assign to a tornado. It seems to me that that's reducing a tornado to the lowest possible common denominator, which in, in my view is pretty silly. Uh, I'm in the process of being involved with a group of people who are trying to explore how to develop methods for incorporating other pieces of information besides damage into estimating wind speeds. Now the Weather Service, they're the people in charge of, they control the, the uh, EF scale ratings. They make the decision, and they can make whatever decision they want to make. But uh, And I'm not going to be able to change that. But I think it's absurd not to take into account all of the information that's becoming available, especially here in central Oklahoma, where we have mobile radars out on virtually every significant severe weather event. I think it's silly not to take advantage of that. If they choose not to, the Weather Service chooses not to, that's up to them. But we're trying to figure out a way to incorporate that data in a scientifically uh, acceptable way. And we don't have all the answers yet by a long shot, but you know there are many, many different sources of information, not just mobile radars. And, and so we're working on that, and what the Weather Service chooses to do with that is up to them. You know, interesting. Uh uh, point that you just made there, Chuck, because I know, you know, I come across a, a couple chasers out in the field, and and it, it seems that a lot of chasers want to brag when they see that EF5 tornado, and sure. if you look at May 19th, and then you you have May 20th, and it, you know the people that caught the May 20th tornado here and more, if they're talking to those on May 19th, they're like, oh, well, you only saw an EF4. But I saw an EF5, and it's like, well, it doesn't matter if you saw an EF4 or an EF5. You know, the viewers that I talk to out here across Oklahoma, even if an EF1 hits their house, to them, it will be the worst tornado they've ever imagined because it affected sure. them. So, sure. it's, you know, ratings, as, as you say, you know, ratings are silly. They're frustrating because it, it seems that all people really care about is the big rating, you know. And, and, and if you catch the big one, well, then... You're you're far superior than anyone else. Uh, but viewers that I've talked to, an EF1 is just as bad as an EF5 if it hits your house. Oh, well, you know, ratings too don't seem to make as much sense. Why do we care so much about the rating? I understand rating a hurricane, uh, you rate it before it hits. How much do you prepare for it? But the rating on a tornado comes after the fact. So why is That's it even right. that important? That's absolutely right. I find the obsession with with that pretty silly. I have to tell a, a short anecdote. I was showing my Pampa video from 1995 at a talk I gave somewhere, and a young man in the audience raised his hand and asked me, uh, "Was that a, a, an F5?" And I said, "No, I'm I'm sorry. It was only an F4." <laughs> and I really felt kind of silly. Uh, 
Now, it turned out that May 3rd, 99 was my first EF5, or F5, and I was not very happy about it because I know what that tornado did to the population. And so bragging about it seemed entirely inappropriate to me. Uh, I was not happy to have seen it because I knew what the consequences were. Right. Well, I felt the same way about the, the Moore tornado on the 20th of May. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I was just going to ask, Dr. Bobo, when we were talking about how chasing just evolved over the past several years, and I imagine, as you said, the Vortex Project back in the mid-90s had a lot to do with Twister coming out, right? And so now you have this new movie, Into the Storm, that everybody's talking about, right, coming out at the end of the week. What do you think, I mean, obviously movies tend to, to hype weather and hype tornadoes and things like that, and, and obviously special effects plays a huge role into it. I mean, what do you think this movie, now that this is coming out, is going to really do? I mean, the chasing community is already so huge now. Well, unfortunately, uh, movies are not about science education. If you want to become knowledgeable in science, you don't say, well, let's go down to the theater and watch a movie. <laughs> but uh, what does happen is that if you happen to see a movie about some subject, your default assumption is that, oh, well, it must be true. And, and so people have all sorts of bogus ideas about storms and, st and in particular storm chasing now based on these silly movies. Uh, movies are about entertainment. If they put people in the seats, the movie is a success. They don't care about whether they're true to reality. They don't care about the consequences. When you think about what sorts of things happen as a consequence of movies, one of the, one of the things I mulled over was that, sure, there are a lot of people who are going to be stimulated by Twister to come out and chase storms, that isn't all bad, and some of them are going to perhaps choose to uh, go down the path I did and have a career in meteorology. Uh, do I think it's bad for that, for them to, to be inspired by such a movie? No, not at all. Uh, I just find it disturbing when movies stimulate people to do silly things like drive into tornadoes. And eventually, we're going to lose people to that process. Uh, we've already lost some chasers, and there is some evidence that we've already lost some some of these so-called amateur chasers. Uh, that's another story. But uh, uh, bad is a negative consequence associated with the movies, but there may be some positive aspects to them as well. Chuck, have you have you seen this new film? Are you are you gonna go no. see it? <laughs> uh, I will not pay to see it. If someone gives me a free ticket, I'll go. <laughs> no way I can know I'm gonna pay it for a ticket. Because you know, you know, you're gonna be experience. asked about it over and over again. And, yeah. And uh, that's that's just the way it goes. I feel like almost we have to go see it based on that part. Can't respond to any of it. I mean, I, I expect <laughs> it to be. I've heard a few of our friends just kind of review it and say, hey, it, it's Hollywood. Uh, if you want to watch it for entertainment purposes, fine. But I also wonder how many people in Oklahoma uh, are going to be offended by this uh, film? How many people are, are, are going to be upset? I know the opening scene shows uh, a tornado hitting a school. Um, okay. You, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> that uh, obviously brings back uh, horrible memories for us. Absolutely. Well, I'm sure that, you know, almost anything anybody can do is going to offend somebody these days. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, again, Hollywood has apparently discovered that disaster porn uh, typically is, is a success. And so they're going to keep doing it whether we like it or not. Yeah, there's always a uh, there, there's always you know the, the movies that come out that are so far from reality. I've actually been tasked to try to find people that want to go see this movie Into the Storm. Um, I haven't met anyone. I was talking to Rick Smith last week, and he said, "No, I'm going to wait until it comes out on Sci-Fi." Uh, you know, I have had a very difficult time trying to find someone who says, 
I want to go see this movie. And I, I know the meteorology is going to be, if you're a meteorologist watching it, it's going to be so far from the truth. You know, there might be some moments where, you know, you, you hear them kind of mention something that sounds like good meteorology, but at, at some point it's probably going to stray away from that. Um, I, I'm still finding, I'm, I'm having a hard time finding anyone that wants to see the movie. Yeah. There's no good, you don't have Helen Hunt. Now, if you had Helen Hunt... <laughs> Bill Paxton, come on. No. Yeah, if you had them in it, maybe I might go see it. I met uh, Bill Paxton when he was here filming for Twister, and Bill's a great guy. On the other hand, Helen Hunt refused to mingle with the proletariat and stayed in her damn trailer the whole time when she, when she wasn't shooting. So as far as I'm concerned, she's got to stick up her... <clears throat> <laughs> That's so funny. You're not the first person to say that. I... I went and actually visited the Twister Museum in Wakita like several months back, and uh, you know, these people around there said the same thing. So you're not alone. <laughs> yeah. Chuck, did you provide some consultation for the uh, the Twister film back? Absolutely back? not. <laughs> I am in no way associated with that. I have okay. <laughs> very plausible deniability. All right. <laughs> Dr. Doswell, let's let's chat a little bit about social media and weather. Uh, I know you're on Facebook. I haven't found you on Twitter, so I'm assuming you don't you don't have a Twitter. I don't tweet. You don't tweet. <laughs> so what I mean, what are your thoughts though about, about <laughs> severe thunderstorms or perhaps even tornado warnings and, and trying to get that message across on different social media platforms? Um, you know, obviously a lot of people have a have a thing about Facebook not being a huge uh, or a, a great way, I should say, of, of sharing weather warnings. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think the problem with Facebook is the sort of selective dissemination of information that they that they do they have some algorithm for deciding who gets sent what and if you don't happen to be on their list you don't get the information from what I can gather Twitter uh, is uh, much less discriminating and there are people exploring the use of Twitter as a means of disseminating and I and I think it has at least some potential but there, like every other social medium, there's a huge amount of outright balderdash and nonsense and misinformation, misconceptions, misunderstandings out there. And the problem that an intelligent user might have is to separate the wheat from the chaff. And, of course, in making a decision about a tornado, you don't have that much time to mull over what you're going to do. You have to have a plan in place, and you have to have some idea for when you're going to initiate your plan. And you may not be able to get absolute confirmation. So, you know, I think these are these are methods that are going to be used, but they're not necessarily the most uh, positive, encouraging thing I've seen come down the pipe. Uh, I, there are other... Uh, media that have, have been considered as additional warning uh, sources, but I think you guys on television are still people's primary source. And, you know, until that changes, uh, obviously you still have a very important job to do uh, acting and to disseminate important information. You know, I would almost say that social media has probably hurt meteorology more than anything else. Before MySpace and Facebook and Twitter, uh, social, uh, really getting weather information either came down to getting a newspaper or watching television. Now you have all of these Facebook meteorologists out there that <laughs> have made meteorology at sometimes more of a joke because... There are just people publishing anything. You know, they see the Euro model at hour 360, and they go ahead and run with it and say, right. huge snowstorm's going to hit Oklahoma, you know, in, in two weeks. And, and so now I almost feel like my purpose as a meteorologist is having to defend someone else's work, someone else's Facebook page, rather than making my own forecast. Well, I would say that, that uh, television and radio have had historically some issues with disseminating correct information as well mm -hmm. so nobody's backyard is completely clean but I, I agree that I think uh, in effect television and radio 
uh, had at least some sort of a filtering process in place, even if it didn't always work the way it should. You occasionally, occasionally had some loose cannons. I won't mention any of the other uh, broadcast meteorologists by name, but I'm sure you know them. People who have been prone to say irresponsible things on the air. And uh, as a consequence of that, uh, it's awfully difficult for anybody to point fingers at some someone else. Uh, nevertheless, uh, for whatever I might think about the, the various media, uh, TV is going to be a primary source for some time to come. You and know, it's amazing, too, that, um, of course, media is embracing social media. They kind of have to. Uh, yeah. There, there's some good. There's some good elements of social media. Absolutely. There's the bad. There's the good. Uh, it's interesting now too. Even the people that intentionally try to mislead others by posting old pictures, and some mainstream media are picking up these pictures and yeah. just redisseminating them. So, uh, if anything, it's made it a more difficult job to try to disseminate this. But the importance of disseminating now is almost more more than ever. I, you mentioned images picked up and disseminated. Uh, it's amusing to me how people are unaware of how uh, storm chasers in particular look out for each other and they recognize pictures taken by their friends mm -hmm. and when some of these pop up inappropriately uh, in some other context, uh, we get that information pretty quickly. Uh, there's a fair amount of, of uh, brotherhood within the, the community of responsible mm -hmm. storm chasers anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and we try to do our best to debunk these uh, mm -hmm. bogus presentations. Guys, I found another really useful tool that anybody listening to can use. Um, I use the Google Chrome browser. And if you right-click an image, you can search the Internet for that image. Hmm. And it will look at all the color scheme and find a matching image so you can see if it's new or if it's from a storm years ago. So just right click it and search through it. It's really handy. Interesting. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, actually, it, it's a way that we have determined the 2011 Chickasha tornado has somehow become the tornado to copy. It was mimicked during... Uh, an outbreak in Nebraska, and then one in Iowa where someone said, this tornado just went through, and you just take a picture of that image, slide it in, and it will pull up at its source. And that goes back to what I'm saying, where a lot of times, you know, we're having to defend ourselves because of some idiot out there that decides to That's tweet right. out a, a picture of a tornado. It's reckless, and I know that there is there's no governing agency that's going to be able to stop these people, but... There's got to be something that we can do to at least slow it down. I think we have to, we have a responsibility to do the best we can, but I, I agree there's no way to stop it. Uh, I don't understand the mindset of someone who does stuff like that, deliberately spreading misinformation. But uh, the fact that I don't understand it uh, is not surprising. There are many things I don't understand, um, and and so I just have to accept that these people are out there and we do our best to put the truth out there even though it's a in many ways it can consume a lot of your time and it's a pain in the butt but we have about I, five minutes time is going by really fast I want to get to just kind of a few of viewer questions <laughs> um, one just the simple uh, a lot of people ask us you know, TV meteorologist, how did you ever get interested in weather? And I know, obviously, speaking for myself, living in Virginia Beach for a long time, I went through hurricanes growing up, so kind of fascinating. And then, you know, other, like, Twister came out, obviously, and so I kind of got on the bandwagon, kind of like you said, you know. There are people out there that um, see movies like that and get interested. So either way, how did you get interested in weather? I mean, how far back do we have to go before you said, I really want to do this for a living, and I want to write all these publications. Well, the decision that I wanted to do this for a living was probably around fifth grade. Um, I was interested in the weather from the very beginning. I have that, my consciousness of that interest goes back to the earliest memories I have. 
So I, I can't point to anything and say this is the reason why that why I have that interest. It seems I was somehow born with it for reasons that I can't explain. <laughs> hey, it's uh, an honest and, answer. <laughs> yeah, it, it's just one of those things. I know many of my friends were stimulated by nearby tornadoes or something they saw on TV or whatever, but not me. So I don't want to call, call the age out here. What about the deadliest Oklahoma tornado in history back in the 40s? Do you remember that one? <laughs> well, I was only two years old, so I didn't. I guess I missed that one. So you didn't study it or anything like that, I guess, after it happened years later? A friend of mine did, uh, Don Burgess, uh, okay. made an extensive study of it. And, in fact, for a long time it had been considered all a single tornado. And it turned out that it was made up of a, a number of tornadoes, not just one. Oh, okay. But, uh, uh, yeah, that was a bad one. And I and have I a, one more viewer the question, 19... at least, and then um, I guess we can wrap it up. So someone wanted you to share your experience with the May 24th, 1973 Union oh. City tornado. Union um, City, yeah. <laughs> Somebody wanted you to share your experience with that and storm chasing, and so I don't know if you can say anything on that. But well, we got a late start that day. Um, if I don't even remember why now, <laughs> and we ended up we drove right past the developing Union City storm. We could see it off to our immediate west, and we went farther north towards an approaching cold front. And we got a phone call from Don Burgess at the Severe Storms Lab, he said, you guys are in the wrong place, so you better get back to that storm right away. Well, the only way we could get to it was to punch the core. Oh. Oh. And uh, so that was when I finally, or that was when I first realized punching the core is not a good idea. <laughs> now, we didn't, we didn't uh, get there at a bad time, but I, I could easily, in my imagination, Imagine if we had been uh, 10 minutes earlier and driven through that core, we would have driven right into the path of the tornado. But as it was, the tornado was uh, perhaps two miles ahead of us, and we watched it as it departed the city. Uh, it was still a pretty spectacular scene, and, and I was very happy retrospectively to have been involved in that chase because that chase led directly to the recognition of Doppler radar signatures of tornadoes uh, that would be useful for warnings. So uh, we contributed then to something important, not just the excitement of storm chase. Right. Very cool. Well, it's 12.45, guys. I don't know if you have any more quick questions. But... No, I mean, I'm, I, you know, I, th I think with, with Chuck, we could probably sit here for two hours and get all sorts of stuff. But, Chuck, I know you've got a busy day ahead of you. I have to get ready for work. Um, but, Chuck, we're, we're, again, thankful that you're able to come on the show today. Hey, we've increased our budget of the Oklahoma Weather Show. So we'll, uh, oh, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll get your address, and we'll send you some goodies in the mail. Okay, <laughs> thank you. I had fun. I always enjoy talking about the weather. All right. Thanks a lot, Chuck. You have a good day. You too.